Okay, so um, well, thanks for um coming, and um, this is my garden just over there. So you can, it's pretty dark out, out there at the moment, so you can't see much. Um, anyway, so uh, it's it's a this is going to be a pretty casual workshop, and so you just 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 feel free to just ask any questions, um, talk about anything, and just just be yourself. It's 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 pretty it's pretty um free so uh well i mean I'm, I'm in my pajamas so it can't be more casual than that <laughs> so here we go so we're gonna start with like rick and jeff and stuff and i'll talk and during this break i'll um be on this island here on gather next to the whiteboard next to the uh fireplace so so uh if anyone wants to learn about crystallography meet me there and i'll try and uh, describe what uh, crystallography is from a perspective of an electrical engineer, if you wish to know it from that perspective. And then uh, George is, gives his apologies, so we will um, play his recordings because he can't be there. Uh, and we'll have a quiz at the end. I think Bill can explain how it works later. Okay, so um, let's just start with Rick. So, so First up is Rick Kirian from ASU. He's my boss and my colleague, and first, first and foremost, my uh, most trusted friend. So here's Rick. Hey, thanks, Joe. Can you hear me? I can. And can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Yep. Thanks again, Joe, for the, the intro. So I guess I've got about 45 minutes, as I understand. Uh, Joe asked me to talk about uh, physics. And I have to apologize because I did not really get to Fourier optics, but there's plenty of physics in here for you, Joe. Um, cool. Go back one. All right. So, yeah, I'm at Arizona State University. Um, and I've been working with Joe actually since uh, for a long time, since 2014 or so, maybe before that even. Uh, it's been lots of good fun looking at diffraction patterns, such as the one that you see in the background here from a, a nanocrystal. Um, so there's like a lot that I could possibly talk about uh, with regards to diffraction physics and things that, that matter to folks who are doing imaging with um, diffraction. And what I wanted to do here actually was to, I actually want to develop the diffraction equation since I'm supposed to talk about physics. And I thought that would probably be one of the most important things to do is to just start with Maxwell's equations and develop the equation that we're all using all of the time. Um, if you're already familiar with diffraction, you're probably not going to get a whole lot out of this, but I'm thinking mostly about like senior level undergraduates as well as um, maybe like first year PhD students uh, who haven't seen this development so far. Um, so that's the first agenda. It's just to develop that equation. We'll, we'll spend some time on that. And then I'll, for as much as I can with the time I have, we'll try to develop some intuition for uh, the, the resulting equation that we get. Uh, this is the sort of the, the diet of um, textbooks that I grew up on uh, in, in learning about diffraction. These are all really good resources. I realize that you have a video recording of this, so you can always come back and, and look at any of the slides that I go too quickly through. And I will be going fast just because time's short, but I just wanted to go through the full development of this equation here. So this is our our working equation, and I think a lot of the talks that follow this one will be using this, this equation. So I want to see the whole thing developed from scratch. Okay, so what we're looking at here is we're looking at a diffraction intensity, which is shown here. And the basic idea is that we're going to send in a, a beam of x-rays, which is coming in over here, hitting some kind of an object that's got a scattering density or an electron density, which is indicated by the row here. And then off in the distance somewhere, we've got a detector which is over here. Um, it doesn't really matter what kind of detector it is uh, for the time being. It's just off in space somewhere. There's something that's collecting light. And the light that it collects and what we want to know is how many photons it's going to collect in an exposure, which is this i, which is a function of the variable q. And q is sometimes called the wave vector transfer or the momentum transfer. Um, the assumptions that we make here are plane wave illumination, so a fully coherent wave, and perhaps we'll say something about partial coherence later. Far field measurement, which means that we're far away from the, the object, and the object is much smaller than the distance to the detector. And then the Born approximation, which we'll talk about more later. 
All right, so setting things up here. Uh, the Q variable is one um, that we need to define uh, immediately in the beginning here. Uh, it's called the wave vector transfer. And what it does is it, it takes the difference of the incoming wave vector, which is shown here, this one here, this K naught, and the difference between that vector and then the outgoing wave vector, which is over here, the vector K. That's the vector that's going to the detector. And the wave vector magnitude is 2 pi divided by the wavelength lambda. Um, I'm going to run through just the definition of each of these terms here, and then we're going to see those uh, developed in the coming slides. Uh, J naught is the incident intensity. That could be photons per area per time. It could be energy per area per time or power per area. You can choose the units of J naught that you like to use, and that will also set up the units of the I over here that you, you measure in your detector. With XPEL diffraction, typically what we care about this is the time integrated intensity, which is sometimes called affluence. So that would be like photons per area or energy per area. The R sub E here is the classical electron radius. I've put the numerical value here. We're going to see that uh, developed in the coming uh, slides. The delta omega here is the solid angle of the detector. So that's kind of like the extent of this here. So we have a delta omega here. Uh, the bigger the solid angle, angle of the detector, the more photons we collect, of course. And then the P here is a polarization factor because we have um, vector fields in electromagnetic scattering. And we'll come to that as well later. And over here, the rho, which is the thing that we're almost always interested in. We typically were measuring I, and we want to know what rho is um, for any kind of, well, not any kind, but for most of our phase retrieval topics for this workshop, um, we want to ultimately get to this rho. It's enclosed inside of this absolute value, and it's there's a Fourier transform here. And so uh, this Fourier transform is oftentimes called the diffraction form factor. All right, so this is the key equation that, that I think you'll be seeing throughout the workshop. And so what I want to do is walk through where this actually comes from. And so we'll take the following approach. Um, <clears throat> there's a few different ways to develop uh, these equation, the equation, the diffraction equation. And the approach that I'm taking here is actually intentionally, it's, it's um, developed in a way that you can use the most common textbook for undergraduate uh, electrodynamics, which is the textbook by David Griffiths. And I'll be using all of the equations from that textbook because I'd like this to be accessible to, to undergraduates, like senior level motivated undergraduates. It's no simple matter to get to that equation, um, but it's at least accessible from that textbook. Um, so the plan here is that x-rays for the most part scatter from electrons. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna develop the scattering from a single electron, Thompson scattering. And then we're gonna superimpose multiple electrons, scattering from multiple electrons, that's going to give us a diffraction pattern, the interference, coherent interference of the scattered waves. And the key assumptions here is that we ignore multiple scattering, which means that the scattering from one electron is not going to be a driving field for the neighboring electrons. So it's, in other words, weak scattering, which is almost always true for hard X-rays. And then we're going to measure far away from the target, which is the far field approximation that I mentioned before. Okay, there's other ways to, to develop the diffraction equations. We can also start with the macroscopic fields, including the polarization field and perhaps the magnetic field, magnetization field, and then the auxiliary fields, D and H. Um, but we're not gonna take that approach here. We're gonna construct the diffraction from one electron at a time. Okay, so no better place to start than from the, the Maxwell's equations. And so I've written them down here. These are for, for vacuum. Uh, we've got the, the E field, the B field, and we've got our source terms, the charge density, and then also the, the current density, J. <clears throat> and again, following the route from Griffiths, what we can do is we can work in terms of the, the potentials, the scalar potential and the vector potential. Uh, these are nice to work with because they lead us to some, some more convenient in homo hom inhomogeneous wave equations. And so, for all undergraduates who have gone through at least the first half of electromagnetism have seen the vector and scalar potentials. Um, and we know that we have some freedom when defining our, our, our potentials. In this case, because we're working with radiation fields, 
we used a Lorenz gauge. And so this is a choice. Instead of the Coulomb gauge, we used Lorenz gauge. Okay. Um, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna rewrite our Maxwell's equations in terms of the potentials. So we're gonna combine all of these equations together. That just means plugging in the B field and the E field into these equations here. We convert these into equations involving the, the potentials. And then using also the Lorentz gauge, we get the, a set of inhomogeneous wave equations. These are a really good starting point to develop the, the diffraction equation. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna launch from this point here. So as I said, I'm gonna go. I'm going fast, and um, of course, if if you've not developed this before, this won't be slow enough to develop it. But there's no way in 45 minutes that we're gonna have everything really pinned down. So you can, of course, you'll have access to the video. You can always go back. And I've also have a note on this. I put the web link here. This is the, a web link from a, a Python package that my group uses a lot. Uh, it's available on the web. Uh, you can download this PDF, which has all of the stuff that I'm talking about here right now. All right, so here's our inhomogeneous wave equations. Um, they tell us essentially how to solve for our potential fields if we know what the sources are, charge density, current density. And there's a general way to solve for these uh, for the, the potentials provided that we have a finite and, and compact distribution of sources, charges, and currents. Um, to do that, we use the Green's method. Um, this is usually not developed in the undergraduate textbooks. You'll find it in graduate level, PhD level textbooks on electromagnetism. And so all of this is developed also in the appendix, again, of this uh, PDF file. And again, that's, that's for the purpose of helping undergraduates get up to speed um, who are doing research in, in diffraction. Okay, so this is these are general equations that, that would tell us if you already know the source of terms, then you could get to the potentials. Okay, and I said we're going to build up the, the diffraction equation one electron at a time. So what we want to do is we want to look at a point charge, the fields from point charge, from a single point charge. Uh, those are called the Leonard Wickert potentials, scalar potential, vector potential. Um, this development is also in the appendix of the note that I've, I've linked there. And it's no simple matter to get there. It requires a bit of finesse. If you've uh, derived the Leonard Wickert potential, you probably know there's some tricks along the way. Um, again, all of it's in the appendix. Um, but the main outcome here is that if you have a charge, which is moving around at a velocity V, um, we can write down the, the potentials. And so here's a schematic of, of that picture here. We have a charge which is located here. It's on some trajectory, it's moving around, it's accelerating and, and uh, has some velocity. It's at a position R prime at a, at a particular time. And then the script R over here is the difference between our observation point, which is just R, and then the, the location of the charge. Uh, one tricky part here is that we have to use the retarded time here, which is due to the fact that it takes time for the information about the fields having changed to reach the, the observation point. And, and that information in vacuum travels at the speed of light. And so uh, this, this requires that we um, write down a few more definitions here. So one of them is the retarded time, which is uh, here. And then this is just the same definition as I've written down over here. And then one more thing is the beta term, which you'll know from special relativity is the velocity divided by the speed of light. Here it's written as a vector, so it has the direction as well. And then the beta is also evaluated at the retarded time. Okay, so it's not actually such a simple matter to use these equations. Um, but the nice thing is that they're fully compatible with special relativity and you will get correct results even for relativistic particles. All right, from the potentials, so we had the potentials here. Um, we now have to relate the potentials to the, the electromagnetic fields, the E and the B fields. And now we're getting in sort of into the, into the, the details here, so it's easy to get lost at this point, but don't worry, we're gonna come back and simplify these equations. What I wanted to do is just to see the full form of the E and the B field for a, a moving and accelerating point charge. 
and these are these are the complete fields. So these will work for special relativity, relativistic charge particles. And there's two more uh, terms that we could find here. Okay, there's an acceleration here, and then there's this vector u, which appears over here. All right, so at this stage, what we want to do now is we want to we're trying to develop dipole radiation. So we're we're going to go into the the approximations for dipole radiation. And so a couple of things that we're going to do. When you look at the electric field here, there's two terms. There's actually the Coulomb field, which is the first term here. And then the second term here is, is for the radiation field. And if you look at these carefully, you'll see there's a factor of u here. The factor of u cubed on the bottom here. This is a reminder here is here's u. And there's a factor of r on the, the top here. And over this term does not have the factor of, of uh, script r here. And so if you look carefully at these terms, what you find out is that the Coulomb field falls off really rapidly, like one on the distance squared, whereas the radiation field falls off like one over the distance. And so when you're in the far field, it's the radiation field that, that um, you're going to detect. The Coulomb field falls off so fast that as you go further and further away, your detector won't pick it up. And since we're, we're looking in the far field at our diffraction, uh, we're not concerned with the Coulomb field. So we only look at the radiation field. OK, so that's good. That gives us one nice, um, that cleans up the equations a bit. should also note that once you know the electric field, complicated as it, as it may be, um, the B field kind of comes along for free. So we just take R crossed with E field divided by the speed of light. OK, so I'm not going to write down the B field any longer. So we have a radiation field. Um, now, this is still correct for relativistic particles. We're going to go into the dipole approximation. And so we're going to go non-relativistic. And so there's a couple things we're going to do here. So one thing is that we're non-relativistic, so the velocity is going to be much less than the speed of light. Another approximation, the dipole approximation, is that the displacement of the charge shown here as compared to the observation point, which is over here, um, that displacement is going to be much smaller than the sample to detector distance. So those are the two key approximations. And we'll be assuming that the, the charge is, is um, oscillating sinusoidally, so I put this here as well. And one last thing is that we define the dipole moment. All right, that's this P. So we're going to plug all of those in. One of the results that we have here is that the script R now becomes just R, the observation, the distance to the observation to the, to the detector. Um, and then over here, the beta goes away. So we have this approximation. So that's going to clean up our equations further. Putting all of that together, we're finally getting to something that's looking pretty clean. And this is the, the dipole, the electric field from uh, for dipole radiation. And so it's now written in terms of the, the dipole moment. That's the second derivative, second uh, time derivative of the dipole moment. And again, that's evaluated at the retarded time because, again, it takes time for the changing field to sort of be registered by the detector. All right. Ultimately, we want to we want to know what we measure, and what we measure is actually the intensity at the at the uh, detector. And so, to get the intensity, what we need is the pointing vector. So this is the pointing vector s. It's one on mu naught e crossed with b. Remember that b came along for the ride, so I've gone ahead and took in the um, this cross product here. The pointing vector points from the origin to the detector that's in this r hat direction here. And then the B field was proportional to the E field. So you get a factor of the E field squared. And then there's the one over C, which came out from also from the expression for the B field. So that's our pointing vector. This is what we measure. We measure, this is the pointing vector is, um, so this is power per area. And so what we would normally measure is an integration of the pointing vector over some period of time. Uh, and then we measured the, the amount of power that's falling within some like the area of the detector. 
And if we look at what this, this the pointing vector looks like, um, one thing you'll notice is that if the, the vector r where you're observing, this is the observation point r, if you're along the axis of the, of the acceleration of the dipole moment, which is this axis here, you see no radiation. And so if you want to see radiation, you have to look at the, a different angle. And moreover, the, the radiation is maximized when you look at a direction that's like orthogonal to the acceleration of the dipole moment. So if you're looking over here, you see the maximum um, diffraction. And this is what, what goes into this polarization factor that was mentioned earlier in the, in the beginning slides. Okay, so this is kind of like how a, di a dipole field is oftentimes um, sketched. Uh, the, the length of these vectors is indicative of the intensity, which is the time average pointing vector. And so it makes a sort of donut shape. If we extend that out into, into, um, into three dimensions, it, it sort of looks a little bit like this, not a perfect drawing, but um, the distance from the origin to this point on this surface are indicating the, um, the magnitude of, of the intensity. Okay, as a quick aside, so I, I'm only developing the diffraction equation. It's worthwhile to note though that, because I mentioned that these, the field equations that we have here for point charges, they also work for relativistic uh, particles, um, charges moving you know, at relativistic speeds. That means that you can also use these exact same equations to develop the, um, the radiation fields from the source, from a, a synchrotron or an undulator, um, or even from an XFEL. And what happens there is, is due to the relativistic uh, Lorentz transformation, our donut shaped object here upon Lorentz transformation uh, becomes sort of lopsided. And, and what you get is a super bright beam that's sort of beaming in the direction of the velocity. I didn't show it here, but the velocity is this way. So this is typical synchrotron radiation. It's accelerating towards the origin, going in a circular orbit with the velocity pointing to the right. There you go, Joe. Joe's got the book. Um, this is a good book that, that has, um, I would say even for like senior level undergraduates, this uh, this book is good. Jens Als Nielsen from uh, Berkeley. Second right. edition. There you go. Yeah, I have the first edition in my office, I think. Um, and here's a here's an image of the beam going in a uh, through air from a synchrotron source with the monochromators taken out. So you see the really bright uh, light that's sort of coming out from the x-rays that are shooting through the air. Okay, so I didn't have much time to say anything about sources, so that's that's about as much as I can say. All right, so let's look, go back over here and look for a minute. So what we know is now is the E field and the pointing vector, provided that we know uh, the, the acceleration of the charge and, and uh, thereby the dipole moment, second derivative in time. Now what we want to do, so we want scattering. So what we want to do now is, is not just um, take any old um, acceleration. We actually want to drive this charge with an incoming field. And so the acceleration, the acceleration is going to be due to the, the field that's incident on the charge. So we've got like a charge here, and then we've got a, an electric field that's uh, coming in. So that's a function of position and time. And then here's our charge Q. Actually, it's the charge minus E if it's an electron. Okay, so the beam's coming along, it's shooting this way. And now this electric field is what's driving the, the charge to move. And, and uh, this equation here is just F equals MA. You got the mass of the electron, the charge is negative E of the electron. And then the force is Q times E. So that's this expression here. And then so the, the second time derivative of the uh, dipole moment is just uh, minus e times the uh, acceleration. Okay, and that also finally gives us an expression for the dipole moment. And this, this is what we need to plug into here. So now we're actually talking about scattering from this driving uh, field. So you could kind of imagine you've got, I've drawn, what I've drawn here is a plane wave that's coming in. So the plane wave is could be expressed in this way. Um, I'm sketching the, the peaks of the wave fronts as they're coming in. That's the blue wave. And then the scattered wave, the radiation fields is the red one that's sort of emanating outwards from the, from the location of the charge. 
and <clears throat> sorry, if we plug all of this in all together, we get a really nice clean expression um, in terms of the classical electron radius. So this is the classical electron radius defined in terms of um, fundamental uh, physical constants. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One way to to one way to remember what this is is it's actually the um, if you equate the uh, electrostatic energy of two charges brought together, two electrons brought together, and you equate that with mc squared, the energy mc squared, uh, the radius, the classical electron radius is the radius at which those are equal to each other, and there's the numerical value. Okay, <clears throat> so we have um, we have one electron. And as I mentioned before, what we wanted to do is to build up the diffraction, starting with one electron, then start adding more electrons. Um, now, the Born approximation, uh, what the, the Born approximation means is that the driving field is equal to the external field. That's probably the simplest way we could put it. Uh, another way to elaborate a little bit further on that is to say that there's no significant multiple scattering. And that just means that the one of the charges here, which is generating the radiation field for that charge, the, the red circles, it's not really going to cause a whole lot more scattering from its neighbors. And of course, that, that sort of meshes well with intuition because x-rays tend to penetrate through things, which means they don't scatter very much. And so the driving field is essentially the incident field. This is going to break down, of course, if you go to like softer x-rays, if you're at hundreds of electron volts or so, um, it, this starts to break down pretty quickly. But at, at um, a few kilo electron volts and beyond. Um, this is a pretty good approximation. Um, and so what I've done here is I've taken the previous expression for a dipole field and I've just put in a plane wave. Uh, so this is now the, the form of the, the driving field. It now has a dependence on the position R prime and each of these charges has its position R sub I prime. So this is the ith charge. It has that position, the primed R position. Okay, so that's the Born approximation. So weak scattering, no multiple scattering. And then the far field approximation comes next. So imagine that I'm zoomed in here and then I zoom out. So here's, here comes my beam. Here are all the, the, the wave, uh, the crests of the waves, the E field coming along. Here's my little charge distribution. And now I'm looking at a sector that's really, really far away. I can't even fit it on the page. So I've, um, I've broken it, it down here and sort of squeezed it in. And the far field approximation, it means that um, it's part also part of the dipole approximation, that um, the distance to the observation point, which is R unprimed, is much, much greater than all of the R primes of each of the charges. So the object is really small. We measure very far away. And uh, mathematically, what that means is that when we approximate the, our script R that we had before in our equations, um, what we what we can do is we can use a, a Taylor expansion here and keep the lowest order in R prime. And uh, this will feed into the retarded time. And we need to plug that in over here where we have the phase of the plane wave. Note that over here, we just assumed that the assumption here was that the script R is approximately equal to R. That's a good approximation over here for the overall scale. Within the phase, though, we need to be mindful to keep this um, the first order term here. Okay, and when we when I do plug in this the retarded time over here, I end up with um, the far field Born approximation for the dipole field. This is this is the diffraction field. Uh, this is for a charge that's not located at the origin, but it's located at R prime. And so you notice that we have a a phase term e to the minus i q dot r. And Q is defined as it was before. Okay. The last thing we really need to do then is to just sum over all the contributions from each of the point charges. And so our diffraction field now, I'm, I'm defining the diffraction field to mean that there's more than one source that are interfering together. Um, all we do is we end up here with this, uh, this term here, the a summation over each of them. Okay. And you see that each of the scatterers has its own phase. There's another intuition for this that's, that you'll see oftentimes in, in textbooks. Um, sometimes textbooks start with this and they don't 
show this approximation, which I don't like. But another intuition here is that if you take a point charge that's located at this position R prime, if you consider the, the path it takes to hit this point charge and then reach the detector, as compared to the path taken to hit some reference point, which we could take to be the origin, to go on and meet, hit the detector, assuming parallel rays, that's the far field approximation, the rays are parallel going to the detector. What you'll see is that there's an overall phase difference in these two paths. And it's the difference between this little green segment here and then the red segment here. And that's exactly Q dot R. That's the phase difference is Q dot R. Okay, and so when we add up a whole bunch of, we, we combine a whole bunch of different charges, that's what this whole term is doing. That's creating the interference. All right, so a natural thing to do from here would be to take our sum and then uh, convert that into an integral. And so now that if we assume we have a continuum of charges, we just integrate over the charge density the density at each point is then multiplied by that phase factor that we had before. Okay, so now we're getting very close to where we started, the, the initial equation that I wrote down. Uh, next, we can write down the pointing vector. I'll skip the, I'll spare you the details here, um, but we take the E cross B, be sure to take the real parts of the E and the B. Um, that leads us to the following. I've, I've made use of the definition for the incident um, intensity. Um, and the last thing we want to do now to get the actual, the, the signal that we actually would measure on this detector is we need to dot the pointing vector with the area of the detector. And the area of the detector can be written as R squared times the solid angle. And it's a vector area, so it has the, the vector direction, which is pointing outwards. So when we take that dot product, that gives us this final expression here. So this is the expression that we wanted to get to. We wanted to start with Maxwell's equations and, and work our way all the way to this, this equation that um, everybody uses all the time. And one thing you'll notice here is that we ended up with a polarization factor here. That's this term here. These are unit vectors. And this could be written as a sine theta, or it can be written in, in terms of a cosine theta as well. Um, I'm just going to leave it as this. This is for linear polarization. Um, if you don't have linear polarization, then you just sum up the intensities from each of the each of the components of the polarization. So you can do this for circular polarization or elliptical polarization or an unpolarized beam. All right. The one thing that I want to modify from here, so we've assumed that we just have like kind of a gas of electrons. Um, of course, the, the electrons are actually bound to, to atoms. And we'd like to, to accommodate that in our diffraction equation. So we'll do a sort of a, a really quick sort of ad hoc um, modification to our equations. The first thing I want to do is just define the form factor. And so that's this, we usually use F. Uh, capital F is what describes the form factor of the overall object. And so that was the Fourier transform of the, the electron density. Okay, the, the diffraction intensity is proportional to the form factor modulus squared. And so let's go back just for a minute. All of these pre-factors here, we know what those are experimentally. So we can, ideally, we would measure the fluence. Sometimes we, well, oftentimes we don't have that, but it doesn't matter too much because it's an overall scale. The, the electron radius isn't too important. Um, we can measure the solid angle and we can determine what the polarization factor is, which means that we're effectively measuring this term here. All right, so that's what I'm expressing here. And so that means this form factor is really important for us. And if we had not just a, a sort of continuum, sort of gas of electrons, and said if we had a collection of atoms, which I've drawn down here as these little points, um, we can then sum over each of the atoms form factor, and then each atom has its own uh, phasor, which is unique to its uh, coordinate R sub N, there should be a prime there. Okay. And then <coughs> uh, the, the form factors finally, because the, the 
electrons are bound to atoms in a very like simplistic classical model. You could imagine that you have a, a restoring force and a damping term in a, a super simple classical model, but it gets a lot of the basic features across. And, and to add that in, what we could do is we could take a Q dependent, um, the, the nominal form factor, which is, this is the Fourier transform of the electron density of the atom. And then we add to that an energy dependent um, dispersion correction, which has both the real part and the imaginary part. The imaginary part just meaning there's a phase lag potentially between the driving field and then the, the polarization of the, the electron. Okay, so that would be like a simple way to add that in. Um, and so the scattering factors, these can, these will become really important. There's, um, I know there will be some talks later on uh, phase retrieval using anomalous dispersion. So these are the dispersion corrections. You can look these up. Uh, there's lots of tables. Um, I've used the Hanke tables a lot. Um, and there's also this library x-ray lib that, that I find really convenient if you're using Python. It's really nice to look up all of these things. So the, the plots that you see here are actually from the reborn Python package that my group uses. And it sort of wraps these two uh, packages. So if you ever need some help looking at these for doing this programmatically in Python, then possibly we have some of the code that, that would help you. Uh, here's the Q dependent part of the form factors, which is shown here. And then over here is the energy dependent. And you can see the various resonances. So it looks like this is for gold. And um, and uh, what you can see is there's, there's various resonances. These are uh, like. Uh, uh, a lot of these will correspond to like photoionization uh, cross sections. So generally, we could use the atomic uh, form factors here with the dispersion corrections. In a generic sense, we could just allow the electron density to be complex, and that would accommodate all of the dispersion corrections. Uh, we can thereby define the scattering density. This is now not just an electron density, but it's a scattering density defined as the inverse Fourier transform of the form factor. And if we wish, we could also relate that to the refractive index, because sometimes that's what, what you can find in lookup tables is the refractive index. That would relate to the scattering density in the following way. All right, so here's some different um, examples of diffraction. Uh, the one that you see here is the interference of just two points. So they're kind of like two points like this. They're diffracting. You can see there's what, what's called Ewald curvature, which we'll describe in a minute. Um, this pattern here is from uh, a collection of like four points. I know it's hard to see the dots that I'm putting here, but a sort of cube of points. And this is a lysozyme molecule here. This is diffraction from water. This is diffraction from gas. And this is Joe's simulation of a crystal diffraction pattern, um, a finite, a tiny crystal. <clears throat> These are all simulated with this reborn package. So. If you want to simulate patterns and you need some help, you can always email me because we have this package that we use a lot to do that. All right, um, so I wanted to go, so we, we've developed the equations. We have most of what we need. We've got um, anomalous dispersion in there. We've got the Fourier transform of the scattering density. There's a few like really important intuitions that we would like to develop in using this equation. I know that I'm coming close to running out of time, so I'll, I'll go relatively quick. Uh, one really important um, thing that we need to know about is, is the Ewald sphere. So I, I've laid down a diffraction pattern in the background here. The origin of reciprocal space is here, right in the middle. And oh no, what happened to my circle? I have to draw it in. OK, so the, the Ewald sphere is due to the fact that we have the incoming um, vector and then the outgoing vector, which points in this direction. The Q vector is the difference between those. So the Q vector is actually this vector here. So what this will do is it will carve out a sphere. So you have to excuse my bad drawing here. Um, but, but in a single snapshot, what happens is that you have a three-dimensional Fourier transform of the object. And the diffraction intensity is going to sample along this, this um, spherical surface. And so a single diffraction pattern can't give you information about the three-dimensional object. You have to actually have multiple views of that object, at least not a single uh, uh, perfectly coherent diffraction pattern can't, can't give you three-dimensional information. 
it sort of samples, you know, within a three dimensional space, it gives you partial information, but it doesn't give you the complete information that you need. And so, unfortunately, my, my drawings don't show up here because I'm on Windows here and I use Linux to make this slideshow. But what I was going to show is that um, if you rotate the object, which is equivalent to also rotating the incident beam direction, so K naught coming in, say, this way, scattering out this way, and then the Ewald sphere then is going to be rotated around. And then here's my Q vector here. So rotating the object, that's equivalent to rotating this Ewald sphere, and we get to sample different regions in reciprocal space. And that's how we fill, fill out the reciprocal space to build a three-dimensional image. All right, so what you can imagine then is, is taking a bunch of slices through the intensity space, the 3D diffraction volume, so-called reciprocal space, and then assembling all of those together. And so as long as we're in the Born approximation, uh, this works really nicely. If you're not in the Born approximation, this doesn't work. Okay, so, so assembling these will give you the three-dimensional uh, three intensity space. Another thing that's worthwhile to, to note here, this is oftentimes a point of confusion I find with, with students, especially when they're first starting to analyze diffraction data, is just the relationship between the Ewald sphere and the detector. Um, typically, the detector is just like a flat surface, sort of like what you see here. In an XFL, it would oftentimes have like a hole in the middle, so it's missing some, some parts in reciprocal space, especially towards like where the direct beam is, because we don't want to shoot the detector with the direct beam. And so we get a limited range of, um, of Q vectors. And one way to see the relationship between these, to take the Ewald sphere, and notice that the, the origin of the reciprocal space lies on the surface of the Ewald sphere. So it's right here. And then if you look at where the origin of the object is compared to the detector, what you want to do is take the incoming wave vector K naught, and then draw the outgoing wave vector K, and then just project that vector all the way onto your detector pixel. So that tells you where which pixel it, the, your beam is going to hit. And then that, that detector pixel corresponds to this point in reciprocal space. <clears throat> and now, if we, this is the lowest angle that you could measure, and you can see here that we're missing, in this particular case, we're missing a whole bunch of information at low Q. So this whole region cannot be measured with this detector. That's a real problem because all of the low resolution information is there, which is informing us on the overall shape of the object. Okay, and then over, <clears throat> excuse me, over here at the, the highest resolution, the pixel all the way out at the edge, that corresponds to this other point on the Ewald sphere. And so overall, if we rock the Ewald sphere around, you can see that there's a, a limit in how far we can get in reciprocal space. So we're, we're sort of limited to a sphere like this, we can measure data within here, but we also cannot measure, we said we cannot measure in here. So we get to measure all of this region. We do that again by rocking the sample. This also sets the resolution limit. Um, there are different ways to define resolution, but this is the typical way that it would be defined for a microscope. And you'll notice that this is in diffraction, it's defined the same way it is for an optical microscope. The refractive index N would be equal to one since we're diffracting through vacuum. Okay, um, let's see, there's a little bit more I wanted to mention. So I only have a little bit more time. Um, so the, the electron density or the scattering density is what we would consider to be the image that we're trying to form from the measurement. And of course the measurement is actually the modulus square of the form factor, but what we'd really like to have is this complex quantity which is the just the form factor. And the, the challenge there is to figure out what the phases are of these. And th those will be talks coming up um, in the coming uh, presentation. So I won't say too much about that. But I just wanted to build a, a quick intuition for this. Um, again, this is for you know students who are starting out with, um, with phase retrieval. Um, if we look at a diffraction pattern here, so this is the diffraction pattern. This is an image of the object created from the diffraction pattern. And so a way to think about what we're doing here, like how we form an image, is we take a point in the diffraction pattern, say right here, where this purple vector is pointing, and we take the magnitude of the, of the intensity there, the, actually the square root of the intensity. And then that particular vector corresponds to a plane wave. 
its wavelength is is set by so lambda is equal to two pi divided by this this q vector and and here's the plane wave here and what you don't get to measure is the actual phase of this wave which is the off the shift of the wave so what we need to do to form the image is to find those phases so that corresponds to taking this plane wave and then shifting it so that it's correct so it's registered correctly and then we could go on and take to take another one so we could take this point over here for example and we lay down another plane wave and we start adding up plane waves and again we have to find the right phase so we're going to shift that wave you already see with two components we're starting to kind of see some of the features of the of the the four spheres and this is the conceptual idea of how an image is synthesized from the diffraction intensities Again, the key here is to get the phases. We need to know how to shift these plane waves before we sum them all up. There's the image after having summed up all of them for all of the points in this diffraction pattern. All right, so I figured I would be pretty close to the end when I got to this point. So I, I had a list of things I didn't talk about. Um, I have about like five minutes, it looks like. Um, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of things, partial coherence, radiation damage, the characteristics of detectors, characteristics of the source. Um, there's Fourier optics and wavefront propagation that I didn't get to, Compton scattering, photoabsorption, fluorescence emission, those are electrons, um, sampling theorems, crystal diffraction, autocorrelation function. And I have five minutes, so I'm going to say one thing about the autocorrelation function, and I think that'll be it. Um, so an interesting thing is if if you take, oh, I forgot to write the whole equation here. There's supposed to be, this is supposed to be a Fourier transform of the diffraction intensity. So I need an e to the i q dot r here. That's supposed to be squeezed in there. So if I take the Fourier transform of the diffraction intensity, um, that's proportional to the autocorrelation of the scattering density, which is shown here. So here I have um, just a diffraction pattern Looking at this diffraction pattern, I can see that I have spheres because I see this ring here. So there's this prominent overall ring. On top of that ring, I can see there's diffraction fringes. There's some diffraction fringes going this way. Uh, there's some, it's kind of hard to tell where they're all going. There's some going this way. So those are interference fringes that are, that are caused by a whole bunch of spheres. And so as you learn more and more about diffraction, you can start to look at these patterns and get a pretty good sense of, of what you're looking at. The autocorrelation function you take the object, you translate the object, and then you multiply and integrate. So it's it's a it's an integral of the pair products of uh, electron densities. And so this is what the autocorrelation looks like. And so you can actually look at the autocorrelation and take this to be a kind of puzzle. And so the idea is, what is the object that creates this autocorrelation function? That's one way to describe the phase problem that people will be talking about throughout the workshop. And so if you take the origin and then you consider some point starting at the origin and going out to another one of these, these lit points, for example, we go from the origin to one of which my stylus has died. No, I'm, um, we go from the origin. Oh, there we go. Well, the stylus is dead, so I'll just have to click. Um, from the origin off to um, one of these points over here, it means that there's a pair of say atoms or spheres or whatever it may be separated by this distance and with this particular like directional vector. And so I've drawn that here. And so the puzzle now is to figure out like where are all the other spheres with respect to the others, to all of each other's. And so we can start, we can, the first pair that we pick sort of is for free because we know that there's at least one pair that has this particular spatial separation. We could go on and pick another pair of these points and then sort of figure that there's another separation that corresponds to this distance here. And so we want to put down another sphere in our object that we're trying to reconstruct with that particular separation. So we'll try that. So let's put one here and then ask ourselves, does this work? Could this particular layout be consistent with this autocorrelation function? And the answer is actually no in this case because if I put this sphere here, these distances are consistent with these, but now there's a new distance, this green vector. And that green vector doesn't appear over here. That would be a, a point over here. And that does not 
that does not appear in the autocorrelation. So we reject that. And then we try another uh, displacement. So we'll try going this way instead. So we'll put one over here. And we could check for consistency with that one. So that means there's, if there's these three spheres are laid out, then we expect to see also a displacement um, along this direction here, this vector, the green one. So we check for that. And we look over here at the autocorrelation function. And sure enough, there is, in fact, such a, a displacement. So that's this one here. So that's good. So we've got three spheres in real space. They seem to be so far consistent with our autocorrelation function. And of course, you can see that this is getting more and more complicated as we go. But it does feel like we can invent an algorithm here. And, and somebody has this. I don't know the name of this algorithm, but um, there is such an algorithm. There is a way to do this systematically. And we could try the next one. And so we lay down a sphere. Again, we check, check if it's consistent. So this should it show up with the vector according, corresponding to this green one. We look inside the pattern, and we'll see that there is no such position. So we try another one, and so on and so on. And then eventually, eventually we'll end up with a, an object that does, in fact, give this autocorrelation function. And that, that's essentially one way to phrase the problem, I think, that, that most of this workshop is focusing on, is the phase retrieval problem. You can think of it also as the find the object given its autocorrelation problem, or likewise, going back in time here. Let's go way back. One more thing just before I clean up those up here. OK, well, you remember the other problem was the phase problem, which is find this phase. You don't get to measure it, but you need to figure out what it is. And hopefully in the next uh, talks, you guys will learn how you, how you do that. All right, Joe, I think that's it for me.